give the Lord a praise offering this morning. Amen. Now, before you take your seat, as you know, Franklin Graham has called the nation to a, a day of fasting and prayer. And, and what I want to do is I want to lead us in a prayer, and I want you to pray. Uh, we live in tumultuous times, don't we? And uh, when the call to prayer is put out, a lot of times we make the mistake of it's, it's very general. We, we're just praying for the world and we're praying for like a, you know, the lost. Well, who are the lost? Well, this morning when I pray, I, I want you to do the same thing with me. As you're praying, your heads are bowed. I want you to put a fine point on your prayers. Put a name. You're praying for somebody? Put a name. Put a name to that lostness or if you have a concern. Um, so let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, I want to begin uh, by asking for your mercy and your grace this morning as we um, worship now around your word. Father, I pray that you'd bring, bring revival. And I pray that you would start with me. Not, not somebody else, but me. And then, Lord, I pray that, that our church, Inglewood Baptist Church, not, not the church down the street, although we pray you'd bring renewal there, we're, we're talking this church, that you would move us out of our complacency, our satisfied living, and that you would change us, Lord. Father, I pray for Inglewood this neighborhood in Goodlettsville and Hendersonville and places that we live. Lord, this area needs revival. I pray for this great city of ours, a city that we love. Lord, we, uh, we are going through a difficult season for many different reasons, and I pray that your spirit would sweep across this county. Father, we pray for Tennessee from Memphis to Bristol, from Montgomery County to Pulaski, everybody in between. And Lord, especially this morning, as thousands of churches and thousands of believers are gathered, would your word, would you, would you make it so that preachers and teachers are especially empowered by your word? And Father, help us to remind, be reminded that we're not in this by ourselves. We're not some lone ranger Christian, there are thousands, millions of believers gathered this morning. Father, I pray for our nation. I pray that most of all, through this season of unrest and turmoil and concern and political upheaval and elections and decisions, I pray that above all, you would get glory you would get glory for yourself and that we would humble ourselves under your mighty hand. And Father, would you do it? We can't, we can't do it. We, we can put ourselves in a position under the waterfall of your spirit, but Father, make, make the spirit fall, would you? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, open them to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're not going to stay here this long in this one verse, but I just want to remind you of the verse that we've been using as we've been talking about Scripture. I love Scripture. How many of you love the Word of God? I just love Scripture. And uh, notice here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, just by way of reminder, what the Word of God says. Verse 16, all Scripture is inspired. It is breathed out by God, and it is profitable, it's useful, it's necessary, it's essential for what? For four things, teaching, reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Why? So that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, let me pause right here. Everybody look right up here. Here's a, here's a quick rehearsal. For the past several weeks, we have first of all looked at those two words, all Scripture. That is that we believe that the book you have on your lap or on your smartphone is 
the Word of God. I was reminded how important this is the other day when I came home the other day and I found some Jehovah's Witness literature on my front door. And uh, we don't believe that their translation of the Quran or the Vedas of Eastern religions or the Upanishads or the Book of Mormon or the, or the Pearl of Great Price or any sign taught. We believe that this is the all scripture that he's referring to. Can I get a witness on this? All 66 books... 39 in the old, 27 in the new. All 580,000 plus words in the original languages, and when they're translated into English, 780,000 words. This is the Word of God. And then we looked at it's inspired, that the Spirit of God working through human agency, Matthew, Mark, Peter, Paul, Moses, wrote down exactly what God wants us to have. Aren't you glad that God is a writing God? Yes. I, looked, I looked early, and the word, write this down, that phrase is used as early as the book of Genesis. Write this down. Then we looked at it's useful. It's profitable. Look in verse 16. It says it's useful. It's, it's necessary for what? Teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Now, we've already looked at two of those words. Remember what we said about teaching? That the Word of God is useful for teaching. And here's how we describe that. The Word of God tells us what we ought to think and how we ought to live. That's just a simple way of it. The Word of God instructs us on how we ought to live and what we ought to think. And then the word reproof is the word, it's a negative word, it means to be confronted. That when we don't think and live how God wants us to, guess what the Word of God is also pretty good at? It's pretty good at convicting you. Um, I've been preaching now, let's see, I started in 19, I think I preached my first bad sermon in 1979. I've preached a lot of bad sermons. Can y'all say amen on that? Don't say amen, you hurt my feelings. And, and for f- all these years, I've been preaching from, I only have one book to preach from. And one of the things I've noticed is I've been accused often of reading people's mail. I, I'll, I'll preach a sermon, and they'll come and say, you, has somebody been talking to you about, no, no. I, that's not the way I prepare a sermon. I don't get in the, uh, I can honestly say this, I don't get in my study and think, today I'm going to nail Scott Harris. Even if he needs to be nailed. What I do is I listen to the Spirit of God, and a lot of times we get in these series, and guess what? Once the Word is released, the Word does what it does. I've had people, I preached a sermon one time on marriage, and a guy came up to me and said, that's the greatest sermon I've ever heard on giving. I'm thinking, what What has that got to do with marriage? But somehow the Lord, he knew that guy needed to be touched in that area of his life, and the Word of God did what the Word of God did. So the Word of God is good for reproof, and we talked about that last week. Today, look at that third word in verse 16. It is profitable for correction, for correction. Now, that word for correction is an interesting word, and it means to be brought back into alignment. It's actually a positive word. So the negative role of the Word of God when we don't live and believe like we ought to, then the negative part of it, it it confronts us, it convicts us, we feel the weight of our sin. But then correction is literally, literally it means to be brought back to its original purpose. So, So you ever had something like this happen to you? And I mentioned this to the 930 service. Have you, do you have somebody in your life who is really good at pointing out your faults? Or, or, you know, you made the mistake. Or maybe you had a boss that did that. Okay, fair enough. I I didn't do such and such. But they kind of leave you there. They don't give you any way out. Like there's no, there's no, there's no, okay, show me how to do it. And the good thing about the Word of God is the Word of God not only confronts us, but the Word of God corrects us and reminds us how we can bring our life back in alignment with what it teaches. Let me give you an illustration. If you've ever been to a county fair, 
you've seen this word in practice. Now, when you go to a county fair, at least the county fairs I've been to, you ever been to the part of the tractor show? And they, take, they have these old tractors, like an M Farmall, a C Farmall, an H, an Alice Chalmer, all these tractors, and they're old. And what do they do with these tractors? Well, they disassemble them, they redo them, they paint them, and get, they restore them to their original use. And that's what the Word of God does. The Word of God takes us, disassembles us, redoes the pistons, puts in new rings, all that stuff, and then reassembles us and puts a new paint job and reminding us of who we are in Jesus Christ. Now, to illustrate this, the best commentary on Scripture, remember, is Scripture. The best commentary and illustration on Scripture is Scripture. So I want to take you to a passage that is absolutely so shocking but so instructive here we go. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is a church that Paul founded in Acts chapter 18. It was a troubled church. The Bible says that he went into this church, he went into Corinth, and he reasoned in the synagogues from Scripture, and out of that was born a church. He there met Aquila and Priscilla and Claudia, and they founded a church. Now, Paul had an interesting relationship with this church. In fact, I told the 930 service, if there's one church that I would never want to pastor in the New Testament, it would be the First Baptist Church of Corinth. It was a messed up church. Just to give you some context, the Bible says that they were in division with each other. They were suing each other. They were, uh, sexual immorality was rampant in the congregation. They were not worshiping right. They didn't know their spiritual gifts. It was a mess. This is a church that needed some correction. And he does it. Look in chapter 6, 1 Corinthians 6, and look at verse 9. Here's what the Word of God says. It says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, none of them will inherit the kingdom of God. And look in verse 11. Underline this, put it on your refrigerator at home. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And God, all, people, all God's people said, amen. Now, I want, you to, I want to take you through this. It's so, there's a lot of stuff here, but let's begin. Paul knows this church needs some correction, a church that he founded with the Word of God, and was instructing them from the Word of God. Here's what he says. The first thing he says, he gives them a shocking warning. And he says it twice. He says, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, mind you, he's saying this to believers He's saying this to believers. Now, I want to be clear here. There's nobody in this room, nobody in this church who believes more in the security of the believer. That is, if you are truly saved, you will be truly kept by the Lord Jesus. Jesus said, I've lost none of them out of my hand. But let me also tell you this. One of the first questions I had to answer as a pastor, very first church that Janet and I went to as pastor in Missouri, very first Sunday, Somebody in the church, the pastor, had run off with the piano player. You've heard, you've heard the joke, you know, three men walk into a bar. Well, hey, the pastor ran off with the piano player, took all the money. Is he saved? First question, asked by a guy named Bud Bloom. How would you like to be 20 years old and answer that question? Is he really saved? My point here is, is, that, is that Paul gives a warning of correction. 
He says, just because you've said things out of your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you've walked an aisle, prayed a prayer, doesn't mean that you're a Christian. Because what you say has to be backed up by how you live. Can I get a witness on that? Now, we're not saved by works, but we're saved by faith in Christ. But faith in Christ alone is never alone. It comes with righteous deeds that reflect the glory of Jesus Christ. So how many, of you, how many people have you known, have I known, who say, well, I, I was saved when I was 16, and they've never darkened the door of the church, and they don't live like Jesus wants them to live. Now, ultimately, I can't make that judgment, but I will tell you, you will know them by their what? By the fruit of their life. Jesus said in Matthew 7, you remember what he said in Matthew 7? It's the scariest passage that I keep in my mind. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. Well, hold it. I thought you were supposed to confess Jesus as Lord. You are. But you're also supposed to let your life be a testimony to your confession. In other words, he begins this correction by saying, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. The way you're living, the way you're living has put you in a danger zone that you may be exposing that you're not really a believer. Look at the second thing. Look in verse 11 or verse 9. The second thing he says to me, he goes, don't be deceived. Now the word here for deception means to be led astray. He, he gives them this gentle warning. He said, look, don't, don't, don't you know that the unrighteous won't go to heaven and on top of it, don't be deceived. Don't be led astray. Now, you might think, well, how could they be led astray? Well, here's how we led. I don't know all how they were led astray back then, but here's how we can be led astray. We come to church every Sunday, and then here's what we see. Hold it, Kevin. Why is it that everybody else is living the way they're living? They seem to be living a good life. They seem to be kind of happy, and they don't get any consequences for their bad behavior. How, if you've ever thought that, I could be a rich man in here if I got $100 from each of you. We've all thought that. Hold it. I'm over here trying to do the right thing. And so and so, well, it doesn't matter. Let me, I'm just going to go out and live myself. And Paul says, hold it. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. You know the other time he used this word deception? In the book of Galatians, he says, don't be deceived. God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. If he reaps, sows to the flesh, he'll reap of the flesh. If he sows to the Spirit, he'll reap of the Spirit. Don't be deceived. So the correcting power of the word that he's speaking is, there's a warning, the unrighteous, the way you're living, you won't go to heaven if this is true, who you truly are. And don't be deceived, don't be led astray. And then he does the devastating thing. This is so painful. He gives us a list of sins. Look at it. Look in verse 9 and 10. He goes, he says, uh, don't be deceived, the sexually immoral, that's a general term that covers all kinds of sexual sins, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And by the way, if you look at that list and you don't see your sin on there, trust me, Paul was a list keeper. How many of you love list keeping? Make a list. All of us, you know, got on there free. I got to do this and this and this. Well, guess what? Paul loved list. And we could, I'm not going to do the painful thing of going to all these lists, but guaranteed you, he's got a list and you're in it, okay? Here's what he does. He goes, guys, let me remind you that the unrighteous don't enter the kingdom of God don't be led astray by thinking that there's no accountability. And just to prove it to you, let me list some of these things. Do you know that the Bible corrects all these things? It does. The Bible corrects every one of these sins with a counter-narrative, a counter-command. In fact, half of these sins are a direct violation of one of the Ten Commandments. Like idolatry is a violation of the first four commandments. Don't have any other gods, don't curse. Keep the Lord's Sabbath, all these things. Don't have any idols. Uh, greed. You ever thought about what greed is? Greed is just the taproot of it. It's covetousness. I want what you have. 
swindling, uh, stealing, those are violations of the commandment. And he goes on he, and he gives these things. And then he caps it off by saying, and the unrighteous who live this way won't go to heaven. But then look what he says. Look in verse 11. This is the most gracious, correcting thing. He goes, now that's what some of you were. Can I get a witness on that? If you had gone to the First Baptist Church of Corinth, there's a very real possibility that you would have been sitting beside a former thief, a former adulterer, unforgiven and unrepentant in their sins, a former homosexual, a former liar, a former thief, somebody who was totally alienated from God. And he goes, that's what you were. You see what Paul's doing? This church that was in trouble, that needed correction, you know what he reminds them of? He reminds them of their wordness. Can I encourage you never to forget your awareness? Well, pastor, what is a, what's awareness? What were you before you came to Jesus? What were you? You know what you were? I don't care whether you'd robbed a bank, killed somebody, or whether you had not committed any big sin. Guess what? We are first sinners by our position before God, by unbelief. And, and before you came to Christ, you were in my condition. You were lost and bound for hell. That's what we were. That's what we were. That's what we were. I told the 930 crowd this. Why is it that the older I get, and I'm not very old, I just lied. Why is it that the older I get, the more I rehearse the day Jesus saved me? What, what, what is that? You know what I think it is? Because now I realize that if, if Jesus had not captured my heart, even at a young age, I would be a very, very wicked man. And I would be very, very lost. But that's what I was. That's what you were. And Paul gives a gentle reminder to this church. He said, guys, Quit living the way you were. And he tells him three things. He says, you were washed, which is a new term, which is a term for, I gave you life. We, we have life. You were sanctified. That is not only new life, but a new way to live. And you were justified. You have a new standing before God. Did you get those three? When we come to faith in Christ, he gives us new life. We were dead, and He makes us alive. Jesus did not come to make good people better. Jesus came to make dead people live. Jesus gives us a new way to live. That's what sanctification means. It's a, it's a very complicated word for meaning we're set apart. We don't live the way we used to live. And finally, we're justified, which means that we have been declared not guilty before the God of heaven because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And Paul, through the word here, gently reminds this congregation and corrects them in the sins that they were committing, he gives them a warning. He tells them not to be deceived. He even lists some of the sins. And then he so encouragingly says, that's what you were. Have you ever had someone say this to you? Hey, man, you don't seem like yourself today. You ever had someone say that to you? Well, maybe that's what we ought to do to each other as Christians. When we're not acting Christianly, maybe we ought to look at you, each other and say, you know, you're, you're not acting like yourself. Your new self that you have in Jesus Christ. Let me tell you how much is at stake. Listen very carefully. This will blow your mind. You know how much is at stake? How much God wants to correct us and realign our lives so that we can have life, we can live, we can live holy lives, and we can be justified before God and it makes a difference? Look at the last phrase of verse 11. Look at it. 
Read it slow. It says, and you were justified, and here it is, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Did you get that? Now, a couple of weeks ago, in the catechism, in one of the questions that we've been using to help summarize what the Bible teaches, we are Trinitarian people. We believe there's one God, Deuteronomy 6.4, and yet we believe that God has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. I want to encourage you this morning that this truth, all of God, not part of God, not a lesser God, but all of God, was and is involved in enabling you and I to live the Christian life. It's right here. He says, we, we were washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus, the Son of God, by the Spirit, the Spirit of God. And you notice in this text, you know this as Bible students, it separates spirit from God, the spirit of God. And it does so for a reason here. In your Bibles, the English words are capitalized, aren't they? God's capitalized, the spirit's capitalized. And of course, the name of Jesus Christ is capitalized. You know why that's so? Because it's, when he talks about the spirit of God, he's not talking about your spirit or my spirit. There is the spirit of man. He's talking about the spirit of God. And he's even dissecting how God works in us. So let me, let me unpack this for you as we close. This is how encouraging and correcting God is for us. God's word is profitable for teaching how we ought to live what we ought to believe. When we don't live that way, the word of God can come like a hammer and convict us. But it doesn't leave us there. It corrects us by telling us and reminding us, don't live this way. That's the way you used to live. Don't think that way. Don't live that way. Don't talk that way. Don't walk that way. Don't do any of that way. People who, people who have that pattern of living don't go to heaven. Instead, that's what you were. But because all of God was involved in saving you, listen, it was God the Father who initiated, of course, all of God, but God the Father who initiated the salvation plan to save your soul. Jesus executed the plan on earth. Can I get a witness about this? He came, lived, died, raised again, ascended to the Father where even now He intercedes for us and one day He's coming back. And what does the Spirit of God do? The Spirit of God takes all the benefits forgiveness, eternal life, and distributes them to all of the children of God. That's how the Godhead works in you. Now think about it. This is overwhelming. The loving, merciful, gracious God just doesn't leave us to waller in our sin. What he does is it's all of God to save all of you. It's amazing. That's the correcting power of the Word of God. You know, Paul had an interesting relationship with this church. Troubled. Can you imagine them getting this letter? And you know how this worked. I didn't say this to the 930 service, but we can be thankful that we have the book all together, all the letters together, all the, the books together. But there was a time when that was not yet the case. That if you went into a synagogue, you, uh, you probably had at least the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. And if you were a really elite synagogue, or if you were at the temple, you had all of the prophets and the entirety of the Old Testament. And then eventually, as time went on, you, you had these letters circulating, Mark and Matthew and Paul's letters would be circulating among the churches. And can you imagine when they went out to the post office, when they went out and after David Jewell had delivered this, this 1 Corinthians letter, and you know what they would do? They would bring it into the church and they would say, hey, our lesson today 
will be from God's Word because we know it's not Paul. We know it's none other than the Word of God through Paul. And so he would teach and preach the pastor of that church. And can you imagine him standing up, opening this, what we call 1 Corinthians letter, and he would begin to read it, and he would begin to expound on it, and he gets to this passage. And all those people out there in the congregation who are acting a fool, you ever acted a fool? I've been at the front of the line got that trophy. Can you imagine he comes to this part? And he goes, Paul, our brother, the Spirit says, the unrighteous will not go to heaven. Don't be deceived, brothers and sisters. Don't be led astray by thinking that it doesn't matter how you live and what you think. Dear brothers and sisters, be reminded that's what you were. I think maybe a amening started right here. Can you imagine this adulterer over here sitting in that congregation? Maybe been through multiple women. Maybe been through multiple marriages. Kind of like the woman at the well. And those words come, that's what you were. But God washed you. God sanctified you. God justified you. Do those words need to come again today? Do they? I don't know your heart, dear brother and sister. I don't know the heart of those who are watching. But I will tell you these are good words of sweet correction that come. And they say, that's what you were. But you're not that anymore. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for your word. Lord, it is so sweet. It is so correcting. It is so reminding. And I'm thankful. I pray that as we leave here today, that, Father, you would just bless us with the sweetness of your grace. The kind of grace that doesn't come with license where we just kind of, well, I've got, I'm covered by grace. I can kind of just do whatever I want. But the kind of grace and the response to grace that makes us go out of here with a heart of gratitude and, the, and just like an eager child to please her parents, she just, she leaves and wants to please her loving parents. Father, help us to be like that because of your grace. We love you and we praise you. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Well, hey, let me make a couple of announcements.